What you are about to see is real. When possible, the actual people involved have participated in recreating events. Viewer discretion is advised. It could be happening right now. The cargo plane loaded with the deranged and the desperate. Men and women selected to participate in a brutal survival game. All but one of them will die. They call it the battlegrounds. For decades, I've searched for proof of its existence. Ladies and gentlemen, what you are about to see is real. Welcome to Mysteries Unknown. I'm Jonathan Frakes. Some of you may know me as Commander William Riker from Star Trek The Next Generation. Others from my work on shows like Beyond Belief, Factor Fiction, and Alien Autopsy. What you may not know is that for almost 30 years I've been a bloodhound tracking a scent. It was a scent I first picked up while hosting the original docuseries Mysteries Unknown. Oh, we tackled it all on MU government mind control experiments, the fountain of youth, cults, conspiracies. After the show was canceled, I would go on acting and directing, and yet I kept coming back to one story. Amongst the spectacle and sensationalism, we had stumbled upon something very real and very dangerous. My name is Dr. Ursula Bauer, former head of Applied Sciences, Titanic Industries. The rules seem to be fairly straightforward. There's between 30 to 100 combatants. Their deaths have all been faked beforehand. They are flown to an island, well, usually an island, and they fight to the death until only one remains. They call it Vir Solidarius, the lone survivor. You said they. Who is they? Well, for years, we had no idea. We never expected anyone would talk. My name is Alexei Sechov, and I'm a former associate of Sergei Kalimnik. How many deaths do you think you're responsible for? Maybe four, five hundred people. 500 people are dead because of you? No, because of me. Because of him. Because of the man they called the Russian. To understand how this started, we have to go back to 1965, to an island named Erangel. Conflict had broken out between Soviet forces and the civilian population. It was a massacre with only one survivor, an 11-year-old boy who somehow escaped the purge. His name was Sergei Kalimnik, the lone survivor of Erangel. As Kalimnik grew older, he found a place for himself in Russia's criminal underworld, working as a smuggler selling guns, whiskey, and blue jeans. He never talked about what happened at Erangel, but the violence uh, was inside him. He was drawn to it and he believed there were others like him who needed it, needed the violence. That's how he knew he could sell that tape. That tape was a CCTV recording smuggled out of a South Korean prison. A recording of an attempted hit that erupted into a full-on riot. It was brutality, raw and unfiltered, and Kalimnik would use this tape to build an empire.
Selling the tapes was his idea. I didn't understand people killing each other who watched that. Sergei explained. They don't want to watch people die. They want to watch people survive. The tape became a hot item in the underworld. Every gangster, pimp, and wannabe kingpin desperate for a copy. And they all had the same question. What else do you have? <sighs> we didn't have anything, not yet. Uh, but Sergei wasn't going back to smuggling blue jeans. He said, uh, we need to produce more material. They were called Gulag tapes. They were prison riot videos, poorly produced, incredibly violent, shot in prisons and countries you couldn't pronounce. This one was shot in 88. And we sold the master for 430,000 US. <laughs> it wasn't hard at all. Just pay off prison guards and roll tape. To understand this trend, you need to realize this coincided with the birth of the internet itself. What previously could only take place in back rooms was now flourishing in the new freedom of the World Wide Web. You've got mail. Oh, in 91, we shot two videos. Uh, Sergei was worried about after the wall came down. But it actually opened things up for us. Oh, they were horrible, no question. But to a certain kind of collector, these tapes were highly sought after. My name is Yusuf Sadeh. I'm a former Interpol agent. I led the task force trying to track down Mr. Kalimnik. The way we worked, typically, you do not look for the splash. You look for the ripples in the water. The ripples are easier to find. You find ripples, you can track back, and maybe you get yourself a rock. With Kalimnik, there was a lot of ripples. We were making more money than you can imagine from the US, Russia, all over Asia. But Sergei, he wanted to go bigger. We had the tapes, the Gulag tapes, which were being paid for in cash. We had reports from prison guards, all of them saying the same thing, Kalimnik. He had investors, people who believed in him, who said that he was meant for bigger things. When you say bigger, you mean the battlegrounds? Yes. The battlegrounds. Our records indicate that the first official battleground was hosted in the summer of 1994. Combatants were pulled from prisons all across Eastern Europe. They would fight until one lone survivor remained. And where did they host this game? Kalimnik had the perfect place. A very same island where he had lost everything. We got the people from anywhere. It was the 90s, so easy to make someone disappear. My uncle, he had an old C-130, we used that. We got the weapons through our smuggling contacts. We didn't know what we were doing, but we did it. I will never forget. It lasted uh, nine days. It was a nightmare. We had people trying to swim. They were hiding in trees. They were shooting at the cameras. And we didn't have uh, no chip in those days. We had to fly helicopter over with a sniper. Every account we found paints this first battleground as a logistical disaster. Well, there's no question. It was a success and there would be more. It's one thing paying off the guards, but this. After that, I told Sylvia I was out. Then all of a sudden, this man vanishes. Poof. Disparu. 
In organized crime, when someone like Kalimnik disappears 10 out of 10 times, they have been taken out. But here's the thing. This man did not just disappear. This man was wiped clean. Financial records, checking accounts, all of it, gone. And right around this same time, we started hearing about these battlegrounds. We started getting reports of a game run in Mexico, in cartel territory. We were getting reports of people disappearing in Thailand, in Finland, in North Africa. The details were different, but the stories were all the same. And they all link back to one man. They do not call him Kalimnik. Now they call him the Russian. A secret cabal of sociopaths running survival games all over the world. For years, I searched for proof and came up with nothing but rumors and speculation. Then in July 2020, the dam broke. There had been leaks before, satellite photographs mostly, a witness account. But even the most optimistic of battleground truthers never thought we'd see actual footage from a battleground. A hard drive was recovered containing what appeared to be video of a battleground on the island of Sanok. It seemed to depict four combatants escaping. Warning, what you are about to see is extremely graphic. I'm the IT guy, right? I don't have any yeah, okay. you guys do upset. Oh, <laughs> Most people were disturbed by the content of the video. But for me and my colleagues, we found them disturbing for an entirely different reason. This was technology we had been developing at Titanic Industries. They even mentioned it by name, the blue chip. Technology that could transmit data directly to the nervous system. Technology we were developing ourselves that, that, that wasn't even on the market yet. You understand? Titanic Industries, a company formed in the 1970s under the auspices of extending human life. A company with seemingly unlimited resources and known ties to mercenary groups around the world. I cannot tell you how many times I was laughed at in a staff meeting for even implying this might be real. The last time I tried to get some traction, my boss pulls me aside after the meeting. Agent said there, he says. Let's say this is real. Let's say there is a man who can do the things you are saying he can do. Buy these islands, make a cartel disappear, and no one says anything. Why in the hell would you want to find this man? What did you say to that? I said I needed to know why he's doing it. I spoke up about it, of course I did. I said I was concerned about what I saw. They eliminated my position the next day. When I went to the news media, they said it was a hoax and that the, the footage had been tampered with. Well, of course, because someone tried to hide their own digital fingerprints. No one would listen, no one cared. The official position from Interpol is that, yes, the Senok tape is a deep fake. Do you believe that? All I can say is that the official position from Interpol is that the Senok tape is fake. Live longer, live brighter, live better. But what if only one in 100 get to live at all? Could Tythonic be the secret investors behind Kalimnik's deadly games? I asked the CFO myself. That was proven to be a hoax. Proven by who? By your company? by investigators that you hired with money that you made selling chips and putting them in the back of people's heads? The breadcrumbs are out there, man, and I'm the big bad wolf scooping them up. Mr. Freaks, you're welcome to try. The evidence is there. A trail that leads from one scared boy to a global crime syndicate. But there remains one key question, why? Why would a highly profitable technology company invest in such an unspeakable enterprise. Look, I have covered organized crime for two decades. Believe me, there's a lot of ways you can make money. Money laundering, um, arms dealing, but you do not do something like this for money. Then why? Why do people do anything? Because of love, because of greed, and because of faith. 
I think these people truly believe in what they are doing. And that scares me more than anything. After that first one, I was out. But Sergei, he had me come with him to deliver the footage to his investors. I'd done drops all my life. But not like this. We showed up and they're waiting. I've got headlights in my eyes. I could barely see. <laughs> then I do. And they were all wearing masks. I thought I, uh, I saw death casting solid gold. I don't know who they are. I don't know why they're doing this. But I know that this is not the end game. All of this. This is just the beginning of something. In the time since recording his interview, we've been unable to reach Alexei. Our thoughts are with you, sir. And we hope you're safe. Who were those masked figures? And what do they want? We don't know. Not yet. But I'm not giving up. Not as long as the answers are out there and not as long as there still remain mysteries unknown.